you already. Sometimes, sometimes death makes you more alive, sometimes death makes you dead. Yeah, it depends on, on the circumstance. Uh, the idea here is to make you more alive, you see. Yeah. <laughs> you want to die in the afternoon? You don't want to die in the morning. Okay, wrong time. No, actually, dying in the morning is not so bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that later on. <coughs> Clarify the views about this. Okay, so I'm going to have one more session on uh, dependent origination, and this next sutta is also quite deep, so I apologize, but I, I, I like this sutta. That's why I read them out. I don't really care whether you like them or not, but I, <laughs> I enjoy them, so that's why I read it out. Uh, so this is a very famous sutta, and I should say first of all, once we have done this sutta, then we will start on uh, dependent cessation on the third noble truth, and the rest of the hours we have today and tomorrow will be on the third noble truth. Uh, uh, and then there it will be much more practical from then on, because that will be how to make the whole process come to an end and all of that. So it will be much, a lot about the path as well at that point. Uh, but this sutta, we're going to have a look at now, the Kachana Gotta Sutta on page 41 in your little booklet. So please turn to page 41. This is a very, quite a famous sutta, because uh, uh, you will have know probably that in the Buddhist world uh, there has been lots of arguments and disputes and uh, great philosophers over the ages, yeah, over the, the years and the centuries and millennia or whatever. Uh, and uh, one of the suttas that was used a lot in these arguments was this Kachana Gotta Sutta. There's a very famous uh, philosopher called Nagarjuna, one of the most famous philosophers in Buddhist history, and uh, some people say he was Mahayanist, other people say he was Theravadist. Uh, so like all really famous philosophers, they're very hard to pin down because they think very independently, they don't really fit into categories very easily. Uh. But many people regard him almost as a Theravada, and he used this particular sutta to, as a foundation for his arguments, uh, Kachana Gotta Sutta, and for that reason it is, it is quite famous. It is profound, but it's not so profound that it is impossible to understand. Everyone here has a, can understand it. It's just a matter of kind of getting into the Buddhist worldview to understand what, uh, what is actually going on. Uh, so this is a conversation between a monk called Kachanagotta and the Buddha uh, about right view. Uh, and uh, you will see here that in this case right view is equated roughly with dependent origination. And that is what is uh, interesting about this. And lots of small interesting points as we go on, uh, even though it is a very short sutta, it's a very compact sutta with many things happening. So let's see what, uh, what it has to say. At Savati. Then Venerable Kachanagotta went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side, and said to him, Sir, they speak of this thing called right view. How is right view defined? Yeah, so this is another way of thinking about right view. I've been kind of making the point all along that right view is so important. So this is one way of thinking about this right view. And the Buddha replies, Kachana, the world mostly relies on the dual notions of existence and non-existence. So uh, this is where already uh, y you may wonder what's happening, and I will explain to you, it's not very hard to understand uh, the idea here of the notion of existence and non-existence, this is just another way of talking about eternalism and annihilationism. Yeah, the uh, general ideas that we found throughout the world at the time of the Buddha, in the present day, nothing has changed. These are still the notions that people have for the most part in the present day. Either you are an eternalist, you believe in a God, you believe in the soul, you're going to exist forever after you pass away. That's eternalism. There is different varieties of that view, different philosophies, but that's the basic idea. Yeah, It's interesting how the world hasn't changed. It's exactly the same after two and a half thousand years. 
And then you have the idea of non-existence, that you will be annihilated when you die. In other words, you still think there is a self, uh, but that self will then get destroyed when you die. Everyone thinks there is a self. That's part and parcel of our outlook. Uh, you can't avoid that. Uh, so either you think the self will exist forever, or you think it will be destroyed. Those are really the two alternatives uh, almost everywhere in the world. Uh, and this is like the modern atheist outlook. Yeah, you come to the end of your life, uh, and then you die, and that's it. It all kind of just, whoops, goes into darkness. It doesn't even go to darkness, nothing. Darkness isn't even there. It's not, not even nothingness, as Ajahn Brahm liked to say. So uh, this is the, um, uh, these are the two views. Yeah? And, and what is fascinating about this is precisely that you know, the Buddha, what the Buddha says existed at that time is exactly how it is now. Yeah? And there's a reason for that, why these things don't change. And the reason is because that inherent sense of identity that we have, uh, the sense of self, is always there. It carries on yeah? from culture to culture, from eon or age to age. Uh, these fundamental things of human perception and how we experience the world are always the same. If you went back in eon, you would still find these things. Uh, yeah? and this is kind of the uh, the point here, these are, again, eternal, almost eternal, ever-present aspects of human uh, perception and experience, these feelings that we exist in this particular way here. So, and again, this is why these teachings are so relevant, the very fact that they can speak to the present time as much as they can speak to the time of the, of the Buddha. So, people rely on these things, yeah, rely on these notions or these ideas or these um, philosophies or whatever you want to call them. Uh, so what does it mean that you r rely on them? Well, it literally means that you hold on to them, you cling. The uh, Pali word here is uh, nisita. Nisita means often to kind of, um, nisaya means to lean on or to rely on somebody, same kind of idea. So this means that these are important things for your identity. We talked yesterday about upadana, yeah, taking things up, clinging to things, and clinging to views and to notions of, uh, uh, to um, uh, theories of a self, atavad upadana, theories of a self. And uh, this is part of that, uh, yeah, you rely, you actually hold, take these things very seriously, uh, and you hold on to them, uh, and they are difficult to let go of once you hold on to them. Uh, so our sense of identity is supported by this, uh, and uh, our sense of meaning in life is supported by this, uh, and uh, for these re reasons they are difficult to uh, shake off and let go of. Uh. So that's the starting point, yeah? The most of the world, especially before a Buddha arises, uh, will tend to one of these sides, one of these um, positions of life, existence or non-existence. Uh. And then uh, the Buddha says, yeah, now comes the insight which overturns this. Uh, how do you see the world in such a way that you actually don't hold on or rely on these notions? And this is what this next thing is about. And this is the kind of the, the core of what this sutta uh, is about. Uh, but when you truly see the origin of the world with right understanding, uh, you won't have the notion of non-existence regarding the world. Uh, and when you truly see the cessation of the world with right understanding, uh, you won't have the notion of existence uh, regarding the world. Uh, yeah? The right understanding here is the understanding of the Buddha, is the understanding of the noble ones, of the Aryas, of the Saparisas. Uh, and uh, you find these such people in the world today. Uh, once you have that right understanding, uh, that is where these notions of existence and non-existence can no longer be. It, it, it overturns these ideas. Uh, it cannot exist uh, in the presence of this right. This is what is called right view, right there. Uh, so when you look at, when you see the world in this way, when you understand the origin of the world and the cessation of the world, uh, then these two, existence and non-existence, can no longer persist as views or notions. Uh, so why is that? Uh, that's what I'm going to explain, uh, how this actually works. What is the point of all this? Uh, so to understand uh, what is going on here, uh, you have to understand the meaning of the word world. What does world mean uh, here? Uh, this is kind of the fundamental, one of the most important words here to understand properly, to really grasp what is going on. Uh, 
And uh, I did speak briefly about the word world before. The Pali word is loka. And in the, just as in English the word world has a large number of applications, uh, it is exactly the same thing in the Pali language. Loka is very similar in a way to how we think about world in English. Uh, so you can talk about my little world, yeah, this is my world, this is how, what I experience. Uh, and then you can think about the whole humanity, yeah, what the world thinks is like humanity. Uh, or you think of the world as meaning the planet. Uh, yeah? Or you can think of the world as meaning the universe. All of those things are meanings of the word world in English. Yeah? It can have contracted and expand depending on the context. And in the Pali it is very similar. It can mean the planet, it can mean the universe, but it can also mean, for example in Pali it has even more meanings, it can mean the sensual world. Sometimes the world just means the sensual realm. Yeah? So it has even expanded ideas beyond the ordinary, uh, what we have in English. It even goes beyond that. Uh. But one of the interesting meanings of the word world, which really is the relevant meaning in this particular context, uh, is a meaning you find in the uh, sutta uh, where the Buddha talks to uh, this fellow, what's his name again now? Um, to uh, the, uh, uh, in the Anguttara, for uh, the guy who walks to the end of the universe, what's his name? Uh, Roy Tassa, Roy Tassa, thank you. So that's why I have the Sutta experts in the class, that's Roy Tassa. Okay, good. So the Roy Tassa Sutta, he is the, Ajahn Brahm calls him the first astronaut, yeah, because he kind of travels to the end of the world, but he, he's, he goes better than the first astronaut. Uh, so he travels to the, he says that I wanted to find the end of the world, yeah? And uh, then he says to the Buddha, but I walked, I had this, you know, my step was so long that one step was like going from the side of the ocean to the other side in one step and I could travel so and so many s steps or, and kilometers per day and I walked for, you know, long, long time and I couldn't find the end of the world. And so he asked the Buddha, how come I couldn't find the end of the world? And then the Buddha says, the end of the world is not to be found by traveling, says the Buddha. You can't travel to the end of the world. You can't find the end of the universe by getting into a spaceship uh, and come to a concrete world, wall at the end of the universe uh, and suddenly the universe stops. There is no end point like that. Uh, and then the Buddha says to him, and this is the interesting part, is that the world, uh, he says, uh, is found in this fathom-long body with its consciousness and perception. Uh, this is what the world is. It's the Rohitasa Sutta, uh, Anguttara Nikaya 4, is number 41, I think, or something like that. Uh, 44, perhaps, or somewhere around there. Uh, and um, so this is what he says. What does that mean uh, exactly? That the world is found in this fathom long body with its consciousness and perception. What it means is that uh, for each one of us, that is the only world there is. Uh, it is your world. Uh, yeah, everything you experience through the six senses, uh, that is the world as far as we are concerned. Uh, every, there's nothing beyond that, nothing apart from that. Uh, that is the whole thing. Uh, so it actually the world is a very personal thing. Uh, Sangsara happens inside of us. Uh, yeah? The idea of carrying on, moving on from one thing to another one, going from one life to the next one, it's an internal experience that we all have. Uh, we go round and round. Sangsara is not like the universe. It's not an external thing. Uh, it is our internal experience of what happens uh, over long periods of time. Uh, an eon is an eon in your mind, uh, an eon of kind of going on. Uh, from one life to another one, moving here and moving there. Uh, so everything is really internal experience. Uh, and you can see this is very similar to what uh, in later Buddhism they have the, uh, uh, the mind-only school of Buddhism. Uh, and uh, that mind-only school of Buddhism is the idea that everything is really mental, yeah? Because everything really comes back to personal experience. Uh, this is similar as in European philosophy, they have schools of philosophy called idealism. And idealism is that the whole universe is an idea, in other words, a mental thing, the same kind of idea again. Yeah? This is very similar to this. This doesn't qu go quite that far, it doesn't say that there is nothing outside, but it says the only meaningful world that there really is, is our world inside, and everything outside is kind of irrelevant. So that is the world here. The world is the world of experience. 
yeah, your experience continuously over time, that is what the world is, that is what is meant by the world here. Yeah. And once you see that, then this sutta starts to come together, then it starts to um, become meaningful. Yeah. Because uh, when you see the origin of the world, what it means, it means seeing the origin of experience. That's what it means, yeah? What is the origin of experience? Well, once you are born in one life, well then experience happens until you are dead. But then when you die, then experience carries on. That is the origin of experience. Yeah, It originates into a new life. So the origin of experience here, the origin of the world, is nothing other than the idea of rebirth. Yeah. When you are get reborn, then the world originates again and it carries on into the future. So when you see the origin of the world, what the Buddha is saying, when you see the power or craving to carry on the five khandhas, uh, to make sure that you carry on even after you die, uh, that is the origin of the world. Uh, the world moves on, experience carries on, experience doesn't stop when you die, as some people would say. No, it carries on. Why? Because there is a cause that drives it forward into the future. That cause is necessary, but as long as the cause is there, experience cannot stop. So this is what the Buddha says here. When you truly see that or understand the origin of the world, uh, yeah, as it actually is, because you see how this is driven forward. And this is what we have seen through dependent origination now for so long, how craving projects you into the future and drives you on, then you know that the idea of non-existence regarding the world must be wrong. Yeah? You don't stop when you die, so that idea is wrong. Or at least most people don't stop. There may be a few who stop. Arahants may stop. But generally speaking, as long as the causes are there, the craving is there, the world of experience does not stop when you die. It carries on. When you die, there is like an abrupt change of level, perhaps. You may move up or down. That's the scary thing about death, the level change. Which, which way am I going to go? That's why death is kind of a bit like a lottery sometimes, isn't it? It feels like it. Uh, but if you die well, like we tried to kind of uh, uh, think about before. If you die in a wise way, then there's nothing to be too concerned about. Uh, but uh, if you've been a bit of a scallywag in your life, uh, and you come to death and you kind of, oh, I don't want to die, no, I can feel it's going to go wrong, yeah, then you have a problem. Uh, so you want to avoid that. Uh, and, uh, but the world will carry on, yeah, in whatever way you have prepared yourself. Because uh, the origin, the source that creates the world is there. The world is created by craving. Uh, the world is not created by God, it's created by craving in Buddhism. It's a very different idea of things. Yeah? Craving creates the world. God has, we can't blame God. Yeah? We have to blame ourselves. We, <laughs> we have the problem. And otherwise we could blame God and say, yeah, God is your fault. You, are, you made the mistake. And uh, we can't do that uh, in Buddhism. There's no one to blame. Uh, we just have to take the blame on our own shoulders. We can't really blame ourselves either, because we are just deluded. We don't really know what we're doing, so how can we blame ourselves? Uh, rather, we just need to get out of the delusion. Uh. So, uh, that's one side of the equation. And then there's the other side of, it, of the equation. Yeah? When you truly see the cessation of the world with right understanding, you won't have the notion of existence uh, regarding the world. Uh. So seeing the cessation of the world means that when you're an Arya, uh, you know the power of craving to propel experience into the future, yeah, to perpetuate the five khandhas into new existence. You know that power of craving. Uh, and you know that if craving is eliminated, uh, then that perpetuation of experience will come to an end. Uh, it will no longer exist, yeah? Experience will just come to a halt. Uh, so you have seen that directly. This is part and parcel of the seeing of the stream entry. This is why uh, this is the idea of stream entry or arahants or whoever is an aria is basically what this is about. Uh, so you have seen the power of cra craving and you know that if craving is eliminated, uh, the world will not re-arise. The world will come to an end at that, po at that point. Uh, so that's why the idea of existence, the idea of permanence, the idea of, of uh, eternalism cannot be right. Uh, you cannot die and then carry on forever ever, uh, in any kind of realm. That is by nature impossible uh, because uh, cessation 
yeah, happens when there is no cause for driving this process forward. The cause to be taken away, everything must cease. So eternalism is also wrong here. So the point of the Buddha is making is that it's not either you stop when you die, everything uh, becomes annihilated, uh, or you carry on eternally. It de what happens when you die depends on the circumstances. Uh, it depends on the, causal on the causal factors. Uh, that is what decides whether you are going to carry on or not. Uh, that is the important point. Uh, and that, of course, is what dependent origination is all about. What are the causal factors uh, that uh, are, you know, are still there or lacking? Uh, this is the whole point. Avidja, is it there or not? Uh, tanha, is it there or not? That is what decides this process. Uh, do you see what I'm getting at? Uh, yeah, it, uh, it doesn't matter if you don't understand. It's okay. It's not you know. You, you, it doesn't mean you cannot practice the Buddhist path. I'm just I'm just saying saying this because I enjoy. It. That's all. As I mentioned before, that's the only reason. <laughs> and hopefully, some of you will enjoy it as well. That's kind of the the idea. <coughs> so you can complain to Bobby after the retreat that uh, you know if you if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> So it's okay, it's okay to have opinions about the sutta, so please feel free to uh, let Bobby know and he will pass it on to me and tell me, tell me off in, a, in an email later on if, uh, if something hasn't gone right. That's, it's okay. It's good to get some feedback sometimes. Anyway, so that is this Buddhist idea yeah, of insight into, this is what this real deep insight means. This is one of the most important things it means. You understand the idea of uh, carrying on and the idea of cessation as the uh, middle way between eternalism and annihilationism. And then the Buddha says, the world is for the most part shackled and uh, uh, Bhante Sujato has two here, but I think by is better. By attraction, grasping, and insisting. Uh, because grasping, attraction, I think these are the things that actually do the shackling. I don't, wouldn't say you're so much shackled to them, uh, that you are shackled by these things. I think is a better way of rendering that. Uh, I just uh, sent him in, <coughs> just, it's interesting, when I read these suttas for myself, I always look at them, and then when I see a problem like that, I will then fire off a post to Adam Sujata and say, wait, wait a minute, you better change this translation. Uh, so I'll see what he comes back with later on, and I will inform you of the ongoing discussion with Adam Sujata that I have to let you know what the outcome of this discussion is. But for now, I say bye is a better translation here. Uh. It's exciting, isn't it? You get live feedback from kind of the world around, uh, and we can kind of get the get the discussion live. It's kind of kind of uh, more exciting. So the world is for the most part shackled by these things. Yeah, we have seen that before. Uh, when you have craving, then you grasp, you insist, you uh, are attracted, uh, including to these kind of ideas, almost philosophical ideas. This is part of the things we grasp. Uh, Upadana, Atavad Upadana, the grasping of views, the grasping of theories of self and all of that. Uh, so most people are like that, yeah? But if, uh, when it comes to all this attack, attack, attraction, grasping, mental fixation, insisting, underlying tendency, these are just different ways of thinking about the roughly the same thing, yeah? It's just the Buddha loves, often uses lots of synonyms to make it clear what is going on, uh, so give you different angles on the same problem. Underlying tendency tells you how deep it goes, yeah? so you have to give up the underlying tendency. It's not just an active, active manifestation of these things. Sometimes there may not be a direct grasping of views, it may kind of subside a little bit, but it will often be there as an underlying tendency. That's why he puts it there. Uh, yeah, and these other words are really just uh, different ways of talking about grasping, really. Yeah. So when it comes to this, if you don't have any attraction, any grasping or commitment to the idea or notion of a self, yeah, or myself, yeah, you will have no doubt or uncertainty that what arises is just suffering arising, yeah, and what ceases is just suffering ceasing. Yeah. Your knowledge about this is independent of others. Uh, yeah, this this is a kind of Buddhism. It's just this is you know, 
this is kind of the epitome of a kind of the Buddhist path, you know, Panchupadana Kanda Dukkha. Well, this is it, really, is, is saying it right there. So when you don't have that commitment to a, a self anymore, that means you are a stream enter, yeah? You have given up that particular grasping and attachment. Uh, you are not yet an arahant, but you don't, you ha you don't have that wrong view. Uh, the um, Attavad Upadana and the Ditti Upadana have been overthrown. Remember that the Upadanas, the graspings, they get uh, relinquished stage-wise. Uh, you have the Silabhat Upadana, the Ditti Upadana, Attavad Upadana, they all, those graspings disappear when you become a stream enter. Uh, the calm upadana, the attachment to sensuality, only when you become an anagami. Uh, and then there may be some very weak upadanas that only happen when you become an arahant. But that's basically how they go. So the first upadanas are given up here. So once you, the problem is myself. This is the problem. Yeah, this is what it's saying here. Is this perception, the attra attraction to this feeling of a self inside. And everyone has that. Uh, and sometimes we're not even aware of what it really means because it's so much part of us. Uh, it's like the famous simile of the fish in water. A fish in water doesn't know what water is. Uh. Yeah, if you want to find out what water is, you have to be a tadpole. Uh. So if you're a tadpole, you're swimming around in water all the time, and gradually you become a frog. Uh, suddenly one day, when it jumps out of the water as a frog for the first time, then the tadpole understands water. Because you have to have a distinction to be able to understand something. If you are within something all the time, you can't understand it. And this is why it is so hard to understand the sensual world. It's the same thing. We are so enmeshed and so involved with the sensual world all the time. Our senses are always turned on always in this world. We cannot, it's hard to comprehend what it means to elevate yourself out of that, this world because we are, this is all we know. And the, this idea of a self is even more ingrained. This is one of the most ingrained things of all, even more ingrained than the idea of the sensual world. Uh, it's so much part of us, we don't even fully understand what it means to have that wrong view. Uh, yeah, for, ex for example, uh, you know, if you look at uh, modern psychology or modern philosophers, uh, yeah, they might read the suttas and they will often say, yeah, the suttas are really good because, you know, they say there is no self and we agree with that because we cannot see a self in a person when we look at the psychology of a human being or we can see is changing phenomena. One of the famous philosophers who said that in the West was David Hume. David Hume said, you know, when you look at yourself, all you see is this changing things all the time, you don't see anything solid in there. Uh, but the weird thing is that even though they say that, uh, you might think that they have right view when they say that, but they haven't. This is the weird thing. Uh, they have right view to a tiny extent, uh, but still the sense of self is still there, solidly inside of them. They still have the wrong view. Uh, this is the weird part, even though they say that. Uh, because that saying is superficial. It doesn't go to the heart of the matter of what we really feel about ourselves. Uh, that requires insight. Uh, it requires the samadhi to be able to see that actually, uh, see fully every aspect of consciousness, everything, uh, it lacks this uh, uh, essence inside. Uh, it can only be seen through introspection, through meditation practice, not through philosophical inquiry. Uh, so when you hear these things by psychologists and philosophers say these things, remember it is actually still quite shallow. Uh, yeah, they're on the right track of course, uh, but they haven't really penetrated right view in the way that you do through meditation practice. Uh, so uh, that, that's an important distinction to, to keep in mind uh, because uh, um, the, the depth of this thing is very profound and very deep, so much so it is very hard to even grasp exactly what it is. Uh, but it relates to your feeling of me as a separate individual. Yeah? It re relates to your feeling of your identity going over time. The fact that you feel like the same person now as you were when you were young yeah? or a child or whatever. It feels like you are the same person. But actually, if you look at it, uh, it, is a, uh, it is much more flexible than you think it is. Uh. So this is the critical thing. And once you put that aside, uh, then the idea of eternalism doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, because the idea of eternalism depends on this entity which is there that carries on for eternity. Uh. If everything is just in flux uh, and everything depends on cause and conditions, uh, the idea of something lasting eternal is nonsensical. Uh. 
Eternalism requires something stable that can always be there. Anything unstable can by definition not be eternal because it depends on cause and conditions uh, to keep it into place. Uh, yeah? So this is kind of the, the insight here. Nor can it be annihilated because annihilation depends on something to be annihilated. Uh, a process cannot be annihilated, a process can only cease. Yeah? So human beings are more like a process than a thing. Yeah? And because they are a process, they can cease. Yeah? Can you cease? Yeah? Okay, you can cease. Okay, good. So you can cease, yeah? So you can cease, but you cannot be annihilated because a process is not something that gets annihilated. A process comes to an end, yeah? And then it ceases. It is not annihilated. And that is the critical distinction here. Huh? And this is why this non-self insight is the critical insight that makes it possible to understand uh, things in this particular way here. So you don't attach to this anymore and then you will have no doubt or uncertainty because you have seen it for yourself uh, that what arises is just suffering arising uh, and what ceases is just suffering ceasing. Uh. When you get reborn uh, it is just suffering arising. Uh. As the Buddhist view is pretty pretty kind of grim view of reality. That's why we were saying the other day when a baby gets born you should probably cry rather than be happy. Yeah? <laughs> suffering, suffering arising in the world. So, but uh, that too is not a very helpful view because uh, the, you know, beings have to be reborn anyway so you make the most of it. It's not something that really helps but that's really what it is. It is really suffering arising. Yeah? And when the Arahant dies, uh, it is not annihilation. Nobody is lost. That's why the Buddha refuses to answer the view that, you know, when an, a, a target after death, do they just disappear or not? Well, no, they don't. It's just suffering ceasing. That's all it is. Uh, that's what it's saying right here. When the Arahant dies, uh, it's suffering ceasing. Yay! Suffering coming to an end. Uh, that's the Arahant dying here. <laughs> this is it. This is, this is really... This is profound, yeah? This is, this is Buddhism. And this kind of gives you the end goal of Buddhism. And this is why people often ask, well, what happens after the Arahant dies? Is there anything left? Well, it's irrelevant. Suffering has come to an end. What, what is important to you? Is it suffering coming to an end? Or is it something existing afterwards? Well, if something is existing afterwards, chances are it will be more suffering. That's usually what it is, because that's what existence normally implies. So it doesn't matter really whether there's something afterwards or not. The point of Buddhism is to end suffering and that happens by the cessation of things. If there's nothing afterwards, it doesn't matter, you have still ended suffering. If there is something afterwards, okay, if you have ended suffering, you have ended it. But the point is that's irrelevant, it's got nothing to do with it. So when people ask that question, you know straight away the reason why they're asking it is because of the sense of self. Sense of self is getting in the way to see clearly what the point of this path actually is. This is why this is so profound, yeah? And this is why a lot of people say, I don't know, this is kind of really hard to take on board. But uh, this is how the Buddha teaches in this particular sutta. And if you now want to leave this course and want to go home, uh, then <laughs> I don't blame you. But uh, wait a little bit longer, yeah? Allow these things to sink in, uh, because they are actually quite interesting. It's a different way of looking at the world. And because it is a different way of looking at the world, it takes a while to kind of, uh, for these ideas to kind of make sense to you and to, um, uh, to work the way in, in a way you can integrate it all in a way that actually works. Uh. So just suffering arising and suffering ceases. Your knowledge about this is independent of others. Uh, one of the great qualities of the uh, noble ones is that they are independent of others in the world. Uh, yeah? Once you see this, uh, you don't really care what the rest of the world says anymore because you have right view, you know exactly what is going on. Uh, and this is what you will see in some of the greatest Buddhists around, those who really have seeing the Dhamma, they are incredibly independent uh, and they do things their own way and they don't really worry about what the rest of the world thinks uh, and still they have that integrity, yeah? still they carry on as before, they know exactly what is right uh, and if the whole world goes against them, they just shrug their shoulders, okay then the whole world is wrong. Uh, imagine that sense of confidence, yeah? the whole world is wrong except for me, I'm the only one who knows. Uh, so, you know, it's like uh, Donald Trump on steroids. Yeah, it's more than Donald Trump. It's like, uh, you know, you 
the supreme confidence, completely unshakable there. And it's a humble confidence, you know, you wouldn't, I don't think anyone would call Donald Trump humble exactly, but uh, this is a humble kind of confidence at the same time. We don't really boast about it, uh, so it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. Uh, yeah, this is what enables some people in the world to do things that are very different from everyone else, to go in a different direction. Uh, if I may say so, this is the sort of thing that enables Ajahn Brahm to ordain bhikkhunis, uh, while the whole world disagrees and uh, just shrug it off and just carry on as before. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter all that much. Okay, all his friends, they, w they did it differently. Uh, and of course, it is not nice. Uh, it feels, doesn't feel good. The whole thing doesn't feel nice. But still, it enables you to carry on uh, because you have that incredible, unshakable inner strength uh, that always knows what is right, what is to go in the right direction. You can only do that if you are extremely solid. Most of us are too enmeshed in relationships with the world. It's too hard to stand out so, so much. It's too hard for the whole world to reject us, uh, yeah? except for maybe a few friends. <laughs> but uh, if you have this incredible solidity, you can stand on your own two feet. Do what you think is right, uh, yeah? as long as you are within the bounds of morality and the vinya and all of that. Uh, do what you think is right uh, and stand your ground and be able to deal with the consequences. You are independent of everyone in the world, really. Yeah. And this is a part and parcel of being a stream mentor, at the very least, and certainly when you become an arahant, even, even more so. Yeah. <coughs> so then the Buddha says, this is how right view is defined. So now you know what right view is. Uh, yeah, It's pretty profound stuff, right view. Yeah. And this is what you get when you become a stream mentor. Once you are a stream mentor, you, this is why some people say, well, that's pretty much you are awakened already in a sense because you know the truth. Uh, and then you just keep on purifying that until you become an arahant. And then it's always with you. Uh, all exists. Uh, this is one extreme. Uh, all doesn't exist. This is the second extreme. Uh, so this is just another way, again, of talking about eternalism and annihilation. Annihilationism, yeah? These are two opposites. Um, I don't like the word extreme so much, I prefer opposites. So all exists is one opposite, and the other, at the other end, is not all doesn't exist. And uh, it's a strange way to maybe all exist, it may sound kind of strange, but the idea in um, Ancient India is this idea of uh, you know the universe and the individual being the same, Brahma and Atman unifying, and ultimately everything being one in a sense. Yeah. So in this way you say all exists, even though there are external things that may seem to be changing in the kind of root of things. Everything is the same. So this all exist idea is just another way of expressing eternalism one more time that we have seen before. Yeah? And all doesn't exist. Uh, is the idea that everything, uh, yeah, in, in the same way, comes to an end at a certain point. Uh, so that is then the externalism. And uh, then uh, uh, the Buddha says, avoiding these two opposites, uh, the realized one teaches by the middle way. Yeah, it actually doesn't say way here; it just says by the middle. The word way is actually missing in the Pali. Uh, by the middle. And maybe the word way should be taken out. I'm not sure why Adan Sujato has put in it. Maybe he has another criticism of him. I, mean, I have to get back afterwards and send another email to him or a message saying, here is another weakness perhaps in your translation. Uh, please explain yourself well, or we will have to delete that word from the pamphlet we are reading from her. Can I say that to him? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I will say I have the support of all the retreatants. <coughs> <laughs> so he teaches by the middle, yeah, it's not really the middle way because the middle way is the Eightfold Path, so it's a little bit different, but it's a similar idea of, of middle. Uh, but th it's interesting, that's actually how how uh, how Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it. Uh, he translates it, I teach by the middle. Uh, yeah, uh, that's what he says. Uh, so I think it can be said. I don't think, you know, I don't think it, I think it's grammatically acceptable, uh, but uh, it, that does sound a little bit strange, perhaps. Uh, yeah. 
Buddhist hybrid English. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's not what it means here. Yeah, here, here it means a, a complete alter, a complete alternative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe you you think middle way is, is better in that sense. It kind of makes it makes it better, or yeah, by the middle. Maybe you can use a different word than way. Oh, actually, he says way. He doesn't say path. Yeah. So maybe that's the difference there. Maybe magga is path, middle path, uh, and then way is a slightly different idea, perhaps. Anyway, <laughs> let's not let's not get too far down this uh, this discussion because. Uh, in the middle, it teaches in the middle. In the <laughs> maybe. Anyway, so what is that middle way? And of course, that middle way is dependent origination. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what we have been looking at. That's why the sutta is included in the Nidana Sangyut. That's the whole point of it. And that middle way is with ignorance or delusion. Uh, is the condition for choices, uh, for um, for choices, for uh, what are these other translations? For the uh, activities, uh, yeah, for the volitional formations, etc. Uh, choices are the conditions for consciousness, as we have seen. Consciousness, the condition for name and form. Name and form, the condition for the uh, salayatana, the six sense spaces. The six sense bases are the condition for contact, pasa. Contact is the condition for feeling, vedana. Feeling is the condition for tanha, craving. Craving is the condition for upadana, the taking up of things. Uh, upadana is the condition for bhava, the existence where you kind of your mind exists. Uh, your existence is the condition for jati, and jati is the condition for carrying on, getting reborn, coming back into this world. The origination of suffering, the origination of the world, is when the rebirth happens in this way. Yeah. So that is the arising of the problem. But, and this is what is so exciting, there is a solution. Yeah, This is third noble truth. And this is what I want to move on to now. And this also is where the sutta kind of makes this transition very nicely onto the third noble truth. Uh, because then it says that, well, when that ignorance fades away and ceases with nothing left over, I'm still on page 42. All of this is on page 42. Uh, when that ignorance fades and ceases without, uh, with nothing left over, then the sankharas, the choices cease as well, the volitional formations cease, the activity cease, and when the activity cease, the consciousness ceases, and then each step of dependent origination ceases all the way up to the end, and that is how the entire mass of suffering ceases. So this is the good news, yeah? Everything comes to an end, so now I want to move on to that ending of things and look at the third noble truth. So let's go back to the third noble truth. And uh, you have to go back a few pages. If you go back to page 35, page 35 you find the third noble truth. <coughs> page 35. Second Noble Truth and Third Noble Truth uh, on that page. And um, so let's uh, carry on just a little bit. We have a few more left, minutes left of the, of the hours. We might as well carry on a little bit longer. Uh, and uh, so we have looked already at the Second Noble Truth, which is the first paragraph there. Uh, and now we come to the Third Noble Truth. Uh, yeah? Now, this is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. Yeah? It's the fading away and cessation of that very same craving, yeah? with nothing left over, giving it away, letting it go, releasing it, not adhering to it. Yeah, so uh, uh, cessation of Suffering is the fading away and cessation of craving. Which craving? Well, the craving, the very same craving, in other words, referring back to the craving of the previous noble truth. Yeah? It says, 
tassa tanhaya and tassa tanhaya is that craving. It literally refers back to the craving of the second noble truth. So it refers to the craving for sensual pleasures, uh, the craving for existence, and the craving to end existence. When you give up those cravings completely, uh, with nothing left over, and of course that is the uh, critical thing here, yeah, you nothing left over, uh, then you have found the end of suffering here. Uh. And you will notice here that you have the idea of fading away, yeah, of um, uh, uh, viraga and niroda uh, and cessation uh, and uh, part of this of course that craving is something that ceases gradually over time uh, it doesn't cease straight away uh, you have to work on it and gradually gradually it ceases uh, until one day you become a stream enter and once once you become a stream enter then the fading away happens automatically you don't have to work so hard for it anymore it happens by itself, uh, because of that right view, always driving you in the right direction, until one day it ceases completely with nothing left over. Yeah, there's not a smidgen of desire to exist. Uh, you have given up all desire to exist. Uh, you carry on in this life because you are you have a body, and that body carries on regardless. This is why the arahant lives on. Uh, it's because the body keeps you kind of in a steady. Uh, state, yeah. So the body is there, so you kind of carry on, and you have com lots of compassion, of course, as an arahant, and you want to help out in the world like the Buddha wanted to help out. Uh, so it's kind of nice to to carry on, but that is the only reason why you carry on, not because you want to exist. Uh, and uh, there's that beautiful story. Maybe that's, this might be a good point to mention the story. I probably told it many times before, but I will tell it again, uh, not to torture you, but merely to remind you. <laughs> So this is the story of Punna. Punna was one of the monks of the time of the Buddha. And Punna goes to the Buddha and he says, Master, I would like to go to the Sunaparanta country to teach the Dhamma there and to go and stay there. And the Buddha says to uh, Punna, he says, the Sunaparanta country is incredibly rough. The people there are really coarse and dangerous and rough people with coarse speech and the roads are hard and the dogs bite you and there's dust everywhere and it's really, really hard. What are you going to do if those people in the Sunaparanta country uh, uh, start to uh, uh, start to, what is it, how does it begin the sutta? What does it start with? Hit them. Maybe harsh speech. I, can't, I don't think harsh speech is there. But if they talk to you with harsh speech, what are you going to do? Well, if, I, if they talk to me with harsh speech, uh, I'm going to say, well, thank you for not, uh, you know, uh, for not um, hitting me with rocks, yeah, or with clods of earth. And they would say, well, what if they hit you with clods of earth? What are you going to do? I'm going to say, well, thank you for not kind of hitting me with the, uh, the, uh, the, the fist, your fist, yeah, to kind of uh, knock me out. Thank you for not knocking me out with your fist. But what if they do? knock you out with a fist. Well, in that case, I'm going to say, well, thank you for not stabbing me with a knife. Uh, yeah, that's even worse. Uh, but what if they do stab you with a knife? Uh, well, in that case, I will say, well, thank you at least for not killing me. <laughs> but what if they kill you? Well, if they kill me, in that case, I will say, well, there have been so many monks uh, who have been trying to seek for an assassin to commit suicide because they were so desperate. Uh, I didn't even have to look for an assassin to die. I just died just like that. Yeah? So thank you for that. Uh, that's the way I'm going to think. And then the Buddha says to him, OK, Spuna, you are ready. You can go <laughs> to the Sunaparanta country. That's what it takes to be ready for the Sunaparanta country. You have to be really hardcore. Yeah? No more messing around. Uh, so he was ready to die. And this is like the Ajahn Shah tradition. Yeah? He would often tell them, ask the monks when they came to the monastery, are you ready to die yeah? in our monastery? And if you're ready to die, okay, good, you can come in. You are, you're ready for this kind of job. Uh, so there's no fear there anymore. Yeah? If you're an arahant, uh, death is not a problem because death actually, in one way, is just happiness. Uh, you're moving on to the ending of the last bit of suffering. Uh, so, f so if someone, if you go on the street and you say, I'm going to kill you, and they say, oh yeah, yeah, sure, whatever, uh, then there may be an arahant, yeah? This is how you can test someone, if an arahant. Uh, <laughs> but don't do it, because you get into serious trouble, but <laughs> in theory, that is how you can test someone. This is very theoretical, uh, this is not practical advice at all. Uh. So this is this craving that you 
give up, with nothing left over. Yeah? So, and then you have these nice little words here that uh, kind of, uh, just to remind us what it means, that full letting go, giving it away. This is chaga, and chaga is a word in Pali which very often refers to generosity. Do you have this word in Thai, Venerable? Chaga? Do you use this word? Chaga. Do you have something similar in Thai? Chaga, yeah? Which means to give. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's kind of the root meaning of this word. You find it also in the suttas. It means to give, yeah? In that sense it means like giving it away. It also means giving it up at the same time. So giving up the craving. You realize it's not worth having. You don't give it to anyone else because that would be really unfair, yeah? If we had to pass the craving on to someone else. So you don't give it away in that sense, but you just give it up, really. Yeah? So uh, chaga is one of those very important words that has this broad range of meaning from generosity to just giving up or giving away as it is here. So these are all different ideas again. The, the Buddha using different vocabulary to give um, rise to broad kind of understanding of what it means to uh, s cease craving, yeah? uh, giving it up, uh, letting it go. This is pati nisaga a very important word in the suttas. Uh, and uh, uh, you don't know if you can recall, you probably can't recall, but we discussed the, uh, the Anapanasati Sutta before, and this word Patinisaga occurs at the very end of the Anapanasati Sutta, where you, at the very last insight you have when you become an Arahant, is you Patinisaga, you give up, yeah? you let completely go of things. Uh, and what you let go of, again, is craving. Yeah? It's the very last thing that happens in the entire meditation experience of anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, it ends with patanissiga. So at the same end point that you have here. Uh, but also it is um, related to another Pali word which is vosagga, and vosagga is also this idea of relinquishment and giving up. And vosagga is, uh, they are closely related to the Vosanga again also has to do with generosity. Yeah? So the idea of generosity and letting go in Pali are very closely related to each other. When you are generous, you are actually letting go in a sense. And this is one of the beautiful things about generosity. Letting go is almost a preparation for the whole path, which ends in letting go in this very profound way here. So it all kind of part and parcel of the same process. This very profound process that is happening here. Then you have uh, this idea of release here, releasing it. Uh, the Pali word is mutti, and this is related to vimutti. Yeah, vimutti means like liberation or release in the suttas. When you're an arahant, you have come to the final stage of vimutti. Vimutti means many things. It can also be, for example, when you attain a jhana state, that is also a kind of vimutti. Vimutti comes in many levels. You're liberate in different levels. But the first kind of vimutti is like the first jhana. Why? Because you are liberated from karma loka, from the whole sensual realm. And that is a massive release already. Huh? That is one of the most important ones. Uh, once you have gone beyond that, again, as I said before, the rest of the path is fairly short. And not, maybe not short, but relatively easy. The swamp is samsara, is the, the sensual realm. It's like a swamp, yeah? You're really stuck in this swamp of the sensual realm. It's really hard to get out because you don't know anything else. Uh. And then liberation goes by stages from that, eventually all the way to arahantship. And here you are released from that craving, muti, freed from it. And uh, not adhering to it, the last word there, analaya. And uh, alaya is a word which you uh, find in many places in the suttas. Uh, for example, in the suttas there is a word that you would probably recognize even yourself. You would say, ah, oh, I can read Pali. And that is the word Himalaya. Yeah, Himalaya, Himalaya mountains. Yeah, the same word in the suttas as it is today. This is one of the nice things about India. Nothing has changed. Two and a half thousand years later, exactly the same names. Yeah? Nothing has happened in India in two and a half thousand years. Actually, a lot has happened, but many things have stayed the same. Uh, it's like a lot of, uh, sometimes I think the Benares, Varanasi, is called the eternal city. Uh, and when you go there, you get a little bit of that feeling of eternalness when you are there. Uh, and uh, the language is one of those things. So Himalaya means Hima is snow, Alaya is uh, 
adhering to or resting to. So it's where the snow is resting or the snow is adhering, yeah, in the Himalaya mountains, because they are very snowy, obviously. Yeah? So that is where that word comes from, the same word in the Pali language. It's quite nice, nice to know Pali, isn't it? Uh, you see this connection suddenly between things uh, and you start to understand them in a different way. Uh, and when you can kind of make sense of the snow lying on the uh, Himalaya mountains, you have an idea what Alaya actually means in this context as well. It's this idea of adhering, of uh, being supported, yeah, of, of stationing yourself there, uh, yeah, of, of hanging out there in a sense. Uh, that is the idea of Alaya. Very often the good thing about understanding a word in its ordinary usage means you can also understand it in its profound meaning in the suttas. Uh. So Chaga, the ordinary usage, is generosity. Uh, but it also means giving up in a much more profound sense. Uh, muti or vimuti means release, like being released from prison. Uh, but it also has the idea of being released from samsara. Uh, alaya has the idea of snow settling on the mountain. Uh, yeah? Analaya is like unsettling, no longer being settled on these things, uh, but being released from them. Uh. So the ordinary meaning of a word carries on into the more deeper philosophical meaning. So if you understand the ordinary meaning, it can be very, very useful to understand the more profound meanings. Uh, this is something Ajahn Brahm taught me when I was, uh, uh, you know, many years ago, when he, he actually is the first one who taught me Pali when I was in Anagarika 25 years ago at Bodhinana Monastery. 25, yeah, 25 years ago. Uh, he started teaching me Pali, that's how I got going with this. Uh, and he pointed out some of these very useful little hints on how to understand Pali in a deeper way. And that's one of the ways that he pointed out. So for those of you who are interested in Pali, read things in that way and you get the deeper meaning. The Vinaya is a great thing to read for ordinary meanings of words because the Vinaya Pitaka, the discipline, the code of rules for the monks, is a much more practical thing. So you see ordinary usages of the words and then you can from that, get a grasp of what they mean in the philosophical and uh, spiritual context in the suttas later on. Uh. Anyway, an hour has disappeared into nothingness. Uh. So uh, <laughs> let's have another break and we'll see you back again at 10.30. Uh. <laughs>